One type of function that's often available to us in functional programming languages and is available to use in Haskell are anonymous functions. These are functions that are given only parameters and the expression that would provide the result without any name designated for that function. They're often also called lambda abstractions, lambda functions, or simply lambdas. They're very useful for defining functions in line that would only be used in one particular context. I'll show a couple of simple examples and then some cases of how they might actually be useful. So here's a simple example where it's an anonymous function that takes a parameter x. You can see that by the slash x. So it starts with a slash and then lists its parameters. It does the put string line function on x. And in the same line as where I've defined that function, I just go ahead and apply it to the string test and it prints out the string test. I can do ones with multiple parameters. So this one has a slash and then it's two parameters, X and Y, the arrow. And then on the other side of the arrow is a put string line function call where X and Y are combined. The two strings are combined. And so I apply this to two strings and I get the combination of the two test and ing becomes testing and then is printed out. These are not that interesting because I've defined the function in the same line and then had to manually provide two values. One of the common uses of anonymous functions though is to be able to quickly and cleanly define a function for a map, a fold, or a filter that can be used right there and doesn't need to have some extra syntax to it to make it a full-fledged function. We may not even want it to be available outside of that setting. So here I've mapped a function that takes a parameter n and does n plus 2, and I've mapped that onto a list 1, 2, 3. Now, for each of these anonymous functions I show here, there are other ways to do these. They're not the most exciting of anonymous functions, but I hope that the examples are clear and that when you see a case where, oh, I really need to do a map, but I need to do something a little bit tricky to it, not so tricky that I want to define a whole other function, you might consider using an anonymous function in that setting. So similarly, this fold is gonna need to take two parameters, the accumulating parameter and the parameter for the new value that comes from the list. The order on these will matter, just like any time that you're using a two parameter function for fold. And so naming them can be very important. And here it takes that new value x and adds it with the accumulator s. And again, there are other ways that I could have done this exact same fold but it shows you how you could write a specialized function right there in line to do the fold on the list. And with the filter, I'm filtering for values where x is greater than zero, and we can see that it filters out the negative and zero values from that list. Here's a little more compelling of a use of an anonymous function, where I want to write this fit range function it takes a low and a high value for the range that is going to be allowed, and then it takes a list of values. And it will make sure that all values in that list are forced to fit inside of that range. So if something is greater than the high value in that range, then we will push it back down to the high value. If it's less than the low value, then we'll push it back up to the low value. And if it's already in the range, then we'll keep that value as it was. And so you see we define a simple anonymous function here that takes a parameter x and then does those checks about x. This function on its own will do that only do that for one value. And so we map it right there in line onto the list that was given. Our users don't have to worry about the function existing or that a map is going to have to be done they can just give us a low and a high end to their range and a list 
And our function will push things into that list, such as normalizing RGB values to fit between 0 and 255, or something like that. So this kind of thing, using a helper function, essentially, inside of a regular function, is another pretty good use of anonymous functions that we'll often see. Another thing that we can do with functions that's a little special in um, functional programming languages is partial application. So you may remember that when we very, very first discussed functions, I explained away the strange syntax for how functions are shown as being, well, you can sort of treat it that like plus in, for example, takes two values, two parameters, and then gives us a result. But another way to view it is that it takes one parameter and gives us a function that only requires one additional parameter before it can give us a result. And that's exactly what partial application will do, is to provide one of the parameters or some of the parameters, if the, a function takes many, many parameters, it provides some of those parameters. And then essentially we get another function from that that we can reuse lots of times. So here, for instance, plus n takes two values and adds them. Not a very interesting function, but it allows us to have some names to put to things. I can define the function plus 10 to be plus n with 10. And so what I'm given out when I do plus n 10 is I'm given a function that needs one more parameter before it gives us a result. And it sort of holds on to that 10 as one of the parameters it's going to use, and then we can apply that function to a single value more, and we'll get out results, the same as if we did plus n, 10, and 5 all in a row. But this will allow us to define some helpful things uh, that have part of their parameters already provided for them. If I was going to be doing plus 10 lots of times, then I can hold on to this plus 10 function and use it on lots of different values. You can see this as, for instance, an incrementer that we are going to have some increment amount. Well, we can just create a function that does that incrementing for us. Here's another example. Um, if I do plus n2, then it will be the same as my plus 10. It's, some, it's a function that requires one more value in order to give us a result. Well, I can map that plus n2 onto all of the rest of the values in a list. And in fact, you've probably seen this already in some of my past examples where we've done things like 2 plus or plus 2. And what we're seeing is that 2 plus is a partial application of plus where it's given one of its parameters. It, ha it needs one more parameter before it's able to give us a final result. And so when we say map 2 plus onto 2, 4, 6, and 8, we're really doing a partial application of plus there in that line. And these are very useful to be able to have some of the work sort of already thought through what one of the parameters is going to be, and then fill in the other blank possibly multiple times using that partially applied function. Now, this sort of partial application will not work on functions that take a tuple uh, as arguments. And many people are more comfortable with or more familiar with defining a function that takes its arguments with sort of commas between them. And so you'll often see code that takes tuple form arguments, but you might have a reason that you want to actually partially apply that and you might want to get that more typical functional function that we've been seeing so far out of it. So here I've defined a plus tuple that takes a tuple x, y, and just adds the two pieces of it, the two parts of it. And the type of plus tuple, as you can see, is not in that format that we've gotten used to. It takes a tuple, 
and gives out a single result. So if I wanted it in a form that I could partially apply it, then what we do is something called currying. Currying takes a tuple form function and turns it into a non-tuple form function. So here I've defined a plus that's a non-tuple form. Well, I don't actually really need to manually define these. I could use currying to define these as well. So I could get something that's the same format as plus by just saying curry plus tuple. And currying will break out that tuple into multiple arguments and I get that familiar format of C to C to C result so that I could do partial application where I give it the first value and it waits on the second value before giving me the result or that sort of thing. I also can go the opposite direction. If I want to lock a function into taking a full tuple before it can give a result, then I can call uncurry on that function and flip it the other direction to go from the something to something to something function format into a tuple format where it takes a tuple and then is immediately ready to give me a result. So here's one more little example, but a little more complex and perhaps interesting example of partial application. Here I've defined a same function that has a few different patterns to it. And sometimes you might think that being this complex means that we couldn't necessarily do partial application on it. But in fact, we can because same will still have this format of it's a function that takes an A list and gives you a function that only needs one more A list before it can return a bool. And so we can do this same thing. We can take same and partially apply it to, for instance, a list that only contains the number one. And we could call that same one and be able to check, is this the same as my list that I'm looking for here? Again, not the most interesting, but if I had some particular special list that I was often going to be comparing with, then it might be useful. For instance, if we didn't have the null function in Haskell that would let me check if a list was empty, well, I could define my own list emptiness function by saying let empty equal same as empty list. And so again, it's partially applied. Its type is to take one more A list and give me a bool. And it will take any type of, or any list here and tell me true or false, is that list empty? And so even the complex functions that we create, we can partially apply them to have some, some of the parameters provided in advance. And if those are commonly used parameters, then we can use them lots of times to apply to the remaining parameters and get our result. So these are just a couple of other structures in functional programming and in Haskell in particular that you'll be able to use. You can define anonymous functions that you can use in that single setting. You can keep them and save them either as part of a larger function or even just give them a name, which is a little silly for an anonymous function, but you can do it. You can partially apply a function where you give it some of its input and then it waits to get the rest. And you can switch between the something to something to result sort of format that we're used to um, in, in our examples so far to something that takes a tuple by uncurrying, or if we have a tuple format function, then we can switch it to that partially applicable format by currying that function. And I hope you find these useful in your programs as you write them.